Well, we're at a very special place in the scriptures today. We're at chapter 22, the book of Genesis. And if you know anything about that, we're, there's 50 chapters in the book of Genesis. So we're almost halfway, which is kind of nice because uh, it's a big, long book. And Pastor Dave talks an awful lot. So we're going to get into chapter 22. It's interesting because any of you who have been through Sunday school, you know the story of Isaac and Abraham and how God called Abraham to take Isaac up onto a mountain. But in Sunday school, they always draw him as a little baby or a little child. Right. And it's such an unconscionable thing to think. The interesting thing is he was about 30 years old. He's not a child. He's his son, but he's not a child. He's a man. That's a, that's a, that's a full-grown man right there. And this is more what it was like. The amazing thing is that God asked Abraham to sacrifice a human being. Nothing do you find anywhere in the scriptures up to this point which says that is cool. And looking at it, if, if you're fresh eyes and you've never seen the story, you think, who is this God who would ask a man to kill his only child? So we're going to look at that from a perspective of some fresh eyes, which maybe you have or maybe you don't. Someday I will figure all this out. <laughs> Last week, just to go over what we went over, we talked about Abraham making amends with Abimelech. You remember Abimelech saw Sarah, thought she was a, a fine-looking uh, female, and said, I'd like to add her to the others I have. I'm collecting one of each. And collected her and, because Abraham said she's my sister. And find out very quickly because God comes to him in a dream and says, you're a dead man. That all happens, and finally he gives his wife back, and he says, this is your wife, and I'm going to give you silver, and I'm going to give you a bunch of other stuff, like the last time it happened. And he goes, you can settle anywhere you want. Well, it turns out that they have a, a strained relationship, and so the Lord brings them together after the birth of Isaac, and they kind of bury the hatchet, and they make a covenant with each other. And these loose ends in this relationship are now going to get sewn together, and they covenant before God not to lie to each other. I think that's a pretty good thing to do, right? Mm -hmm. it, it would almost be assumed, except Abimelech knows that God is blessing this guy regardless of his imperfection. And he says, well, I want to be on your good side. Let's agree nobody's going to lie to each other. And Abraham says, well, it's funny you should say that because some of your people have come and taken over my well that I dug. And it very well could be seven wells in this area because he gives seven lambs in a, in a commitment and he goes, well, this is the first time hearing about it. Apparently, Abimelech doesn't know a whole bunch about a lot of things. Because he didn't know that this guy, this guy had a wife, and he didn't know that somebody stole his wells, and he, you know, he didn't know anything. He, but he's, he's at the top, I guess, very isolated from things. And so he says, the well is yours. And he says, well, I want to buy it from you. So he buys it from him, makes his commitment, gives him these lambs, and he goes, they'll always be watching you to make sure that you keep this commitment. These seven lambs. I don't know where they ended up probably on somebody's dinner table, but. <laughs> so he ties all these loose ends together and it seems like a strange hiccup in the middle of all this, but God is just constantly testing Abraham, purifying Abraham, protecting Abraham against himself as his own worst enemy. And so we've been looking at this story. So this week, we're gonna look at Abraham and his sacrifice of his son. It says in Genesis 22, two, well, actually, I will just read the first 10 verses for you, if you follow along with me. And it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, well, that, that's good because that's his name. And he said, here I am. And he said, now take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and he saddled his donkey. He took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. 
And he split the wood and the burnt, uh, for the burnt offering, and he rose and went to the place of which God had told him. And then, on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes, and he saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and fellowship or worship. And we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood and the burnt offering and he laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife. And the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, here I am, my son. And then he said, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together and they came to the place in which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order and he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand, and he took the knife to slay his son. Now, this sounds like something right out of a horror movie. Uh, Jerry Springer's got nothing on the Bible. A father killing his only son, the one that he loves. Let's take it apart and see why in the world would God do this. Now, it came to pass after these things. And you say, well, what is after these things? Well, if you remember, he's been being tested over and over and over and over. And some of them he does very well. Some of them he doesn't do so well. God said, leave your family. Leave everybody that's in your family. Get out of your father's household and go to a place that I will show you. And so he drags his father, Terah, with him and his nephew, Lot. Didn't do so good with the leaving the family test. Eventually, he goes a bit north and his father dies. And then he takes Lot into the land and he has all of this trouble with him. As soon as they get to the promised land, there's a famine. So what's he do? He leaves and goes to Egypt. So he kind of doesn't stand up to that and staying in a place where God's called him to be because nobody likes to be uncomfortable. Nobody likes to be starving and scraping, which makes you wonder why people live in New Jersey. <laughs> and so there's the famine test in which he's charged in chapter 12. And then we move on to the fellowship test. And Lot is given a choice as to where he wants to go because they can't stay in the same land. And so he says, listen, we got to split up. God has made it abundantly clear through the ability of us not being able to live together, this kind of discomfort, we need to split. You go left, I'll go right. You go north, I'll go south. You choose whatever you want. Lot looks down into the Valley of Sodom, a well-watered place, and he goes, that's for me. That's prosperity. I'm on my way. And Abram says, fine, I'll go the other direction. So Abraham does a wonderful thing with that, and he gives his nephew first choice. So he passes that test pretty well. That's the fellowship test. Then there's the fight test. Hey, your nephew's been taken and carried away. What are you going to do about it? He ends up taking a whole bunch of his own men from his own household, over 300 of them, who are armed and trained fighters, which tells you he's got a pretty big household, if that's his security detail. And they run after all these kings. Remember the northern kings came on the southern kings and five against four. And he went and rescued him and brought him back. He seemed to do really well with the fight test. You know, we, we do well with a fight. If you're a fighter, you tend to do well with those things. But it's funny, just a simple question like, is that your sister or your wife? He couldn't answer straight. Then there's the fortune test. Sodom, the, the, the king of Sodom, offers him a reward for everything that he's done. He says, listen, I'm going to take all the people back into the city, but you can have all the wealth, you can have everything. And he says, I won't take a penny from you. And he meets Melchizedek, and he's got all of these wonderful things. So he's tested with this fortune, and he says no. And then there's the fatherhood test, where God says, I'm going to give you a child. And it'll be, you'll have 
you'll have descendants like the stars of the sky, like the sand and the seashore. If you can count those, you'll be able to count your descendants, which means you're going to have so many, you're not going to know what's going on. Time goes by and Sarah says, well, maybe you got it wrong, Abraham. Maybe it's through another woman because it's not happening here. I'm, I'm worn out. Here, here's my handmaid. And he says, uh, okay. So he doesn't do well with the fatherhood test and waiting on God and being patient. Uh, I don't know anybody that's got that down, myself included. And then he's got this farewell test. God said, what you need to do is you need to take Ishmael and this woman that you thought would be a good wife for you or your wife thought would be a good wife for you to bear children, and they need to go. They are a representative of the flesh in which God cannot bless, and they have to go. And he passes that test. If you remember, he wakes up early in the morning, he gets a, a, a thing of water and some food and puts it on her, and he goes, you got to go. Not like it wasn't without cause. They were causing some trouble for the new child who had arrived. So the flesh ends up having to go away until God does his thing. And then we see Abimelech. Abimelech, he sows this wonderful, or cuts this covenant with him, and they make peace. And so he passes that test. And uh, he, he doesn't go up to him and say, hey, listen, you stole my well until there was an opportunity. He goes, oh, well, you know, since we're talking, you stole my well. So he's doing pretty well. He has his ups, he has his downs, but if you notice, he seems to be getting stronger in his faith, which is what happens with us when we're tested, right? Yeah. Uh, unless we just fumble and fall, and that would be terrible. But there should be some remnant of Christ in you getting stronger, even as it was with Abraham. So, after those things, all of these tests, so why? Why does God test Abraham? Would you be able to pass such a test if God said, I want you to take your son, your only son, and I want you to sacrifice him? Well, you know, the Lord asks us all to do that, doesn't he? Because they're his before they're yours. And you have to let go of them. You can't control every aspect of their life, can you? Come on. You can't. Of course you can't. You have to let them go at some point. Hopefully you're raising adults and not criminals. Do you know the difference? Raising adults means you're teaching children to take autonomy, They take responsibility for their actions. And sometimes they have to make up their own mind and fall flat on their face. And that's how they learn. If you never let them fail, they'll never learn. If you always have strings attached. So you're either raising that or you're raising a criminal. Because if you're taking care of them and giving them everything that they need, they'll never fly the coop. They'll never leave the nest. Because they've got everything they want from mommy and daddy. I may have stayed home and had my dinner made and my laundry done and my bed made and, and, and have everything that I want. I can stay home until I'm, you know, until mom and dad are gone. But that isn't God's plan, is it? You're not sure. Okay quiet crowd today. So why does he test Abraham? I, I, don't, I don't like tests. Do you like tests? It's like, watch this. I'm going to stand on Pastor Dave's foot. Let's see what he does. You maniacal, crazy person who ever thought of that. I, I picked it up some, somewhere in the air. Somebody was thinking that. Here's the thing. James chapter 1 talks about tests, trials, temptation, which are somewhat synonymous, and it's hard to know when you're in the middle of it. James chapter 1 says this, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Which means sometimes when you want to pray a difficult situation away, you're opposed to what God is trying to do in your life. Because you're supposed to let patience have its perfect work. Allow this trial to have its full effect on you so that the fruit in which God's trying to grow in your life actually happens. 
I think very often we rush to prayer and we ask God to take away things and fix things and bless things and all of that because we just don't want the discomfort, not understanding that he uses that to condition us to make us soldiers, to make us sons. So, our responsibility is whatever it is that comes our way, you know, God will not allow you to go through anything you can't handle with him. Now, of course, he'll give you things you can't handle. Don't let anybody tell you, well, he'll never give you anything you can't handle. He gives you things you can't handle all the time so that you go to him. You see how that works? I've asked my grandchildren to do things that I know they can't do. We just got a, 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 like a cord and a half of wood and all the little ones from the 13 all the way down to the three-year-old said, all right, let's put the wood away. It's, you know, it's a stack this high. It's in my driveway. And they're like, we can't do that. I said, of course you can. I'll help you. And they were like, okay. I know they wouldn't be able to do it because I stack it nice and straight and it's nice and stable. And, you know, I put a tarp over it and all of that kind of stuff. And we got a wheelbarrow and we tried to figure out some other ways to cart it in mass. And we had a blast. These kids never had so much fun with wood. So whenever you have a trial, it's like a big giant stack of wood that you have to move. It's like, okay, Lord, I'm going to accept this from your hand because either it is brought by God or it is by his permission and it's got his signature on it. When you understand that, it leaves very little room for complaining. You guys are extremely quiet today. All right. Is this just not working for me or We'll try again. Or maybe again. There we go. God's motivation and intention is our purification of our faith. It's the perfection of our character and the protection from sin. That's why God lets trials, difficulties, hardships in our lives. Because he doesn't want a bunch of weak, spoiled brats for kids. Make sense? I know you might not like that news, but it's true. The purification of our faith, because the more that we depend upon him, the more he can shine in our lives and show us his power. He perfects our character and teaches us to have patience, which we're supposed to let it have its perfect work that we might be complete and entire, lacking no good thing. And it's supposed to give us protection from sin, because when we go to the Lord and trust in him and we're not relying upon our own strength, God is actually teaching us so we're protected from our own sinful proclivities, like doing everything yourself. Doggone it, I'm a man. I can handle anything. What do you got? No, you can't. But with God, you can. Make sense? All right. James chapter 1, again, verses 12 to 15 says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he's tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So, if I fall short in a trial or a difficulty or a hardship, I can't blame God and say, you gave me something that was too hard. No, what happened was I quit too early. Amen? Amen. All right, I just want to make sure you're all with me. That's good. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 gives us this wonderful promise. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. In other words, we're all pretty much the same. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, of course, with his help, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Do you believe that? There is nothing too hard that the Lord will allow you to go through that he and you together can't lick. That's the deal. 
If you're on your own, you're going to lean on your own understanding and all your ways you're not going to acknowledge him, then he's not going to direct your paths. Right? Okay. Good. I'll show you a couple of things. This word to test Abraham is this bokan, bokan, which is, has a little in it. To examine, to try, and to prove. Like in Psalm 26, 2, David says, examine me, O Lord, and prove me, or, 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 or show me to be what I am. Try my mind and my heart. Now, that's a pretty bold prayer, isn't it? I don't know. Some of the stuff that God squeezes out of me, I, I don't really want to see. But I guess it's the only way to really deal with it. And so he says, try my mind and my heart. And also Job in 23.10, he says, but he, meaning God, knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. The purification of gold is that you throw the ore into the crucible and you heat it up and the gold then melts and it's heavier than anything. So it goes down to the bottom and all the impurities and the other rocks and the garbage kind of floats to the top and you scrape that stuff. It's called slag. Everybody say slag. slag. See, it's a vocabulary day. Take all that slag off of there until it's completely 24 karat gold and you can see your reflection in it. And you know, that's what Jesus wants to see in us. This is reflection. And so these things come into our lives to purify us and to show us what we're made of. And if it didn't happen, we wouldn't know what we're made of and we'd have delusions of grandeur and think we got it all together. All right. Hermanusia. That means minutia in hermeneutics. I'll show you some... Hermanusha. Notice Abraham says, here I am. And, and that's a little, it's, it's almost like hide and seek, but that's not what he's saying. It's a statement of submission and readiness to obey. It's, it's kind of like a, like a yes, sir sort of thing. You see that Abraham is at God's disposal. And that's what that shows me. So that's from the language itself. It's interesting. He says, I want you to take your son your only son, Isaac, but he has another son. It's Ishmael. It's interesting, God doesn't recognize him. Doesn't recognize him as a son. Doesn't recognize her as a wife, Hagar. I want you to take your son, your only son. Every word in the scripture is deliberate. It's there by the Holy Spirit's design. And as you look at it, there is no end to its depth. But when he says, your only son, it's on purpose. Whom you love. This is the first time love is mentioned in the scripture. It's the law of first mention. When you see something mentioned first in the scripture, it usually says a whole lot about that topic. It's the first time love is mentioned in the scripture. Surprising, right? Get all the way to chapter 22. And it's the love for a father and a son. Go to the New Testament. The first time love is ever mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and Luke is when Jesus is being baptized and the father shows up and he says, this is my beloved son. In the book of John, Love comes up the first time in John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Isn't that amazing? The first time in the Old Testament love is mentioned, it's about a father and a son. In the four gospels that start out, love first mentioned talks about God the father's love for his son. Accidental? I don't think so. Moriah means chosen by Jehovah. He says, I want you to go to a place that's chosen by me. That's what Moriah means. I don't think Moriah Carey knows that. <laughs> and I want you to make of him a burnt offering. I mean, there, there are some really terrible ways to die. Stabbing is terrible. Burning, I think, is probably worse. And yet lots of people in the name of Christianity have been assassinated in these ways. So he wants to make a burnt offering. If you go into Leviticus, you'll 
look at all of the laws that are there, which it's a little hard to wade through, but there are little gems along the way that you find. A burnt offering is something which is to be sacrificed to the north of the altar. It's a rather interesting little picky own thing, and you wonder, why is that? Well, it just so happens that Jesus was crucified just north of the altar. So there are all of these little things that if you dig into it, you'll find all sorts of little gems. So Abraham rose early in the morning. He saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and he went to the place of which God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and he saw the place afar off. By the way, it's about 60 miles, 58 miles or 60 miles. Um, so it's like 20 miles a day. It's on the third day that he sees the place. And it's interesting he mentions the third day. It's interesting that there are two men with him. It's interesting. So think about it. You've got Abraham, you've got Isaac, and you've got two other men. You've got the father, you've got the son, and you have two other men. Interesting. Just thought I'd put that in your cranium for right now. He sees the place while it's still afar off. And so this is their trek, by the way. So here's Beersheba, where they were from. And this is the way that they went up here to a little place called Salem, which becomes Jerusalem, just in case you didn't know that. And he's going to a place where the crag of the rock looks like this, which you might know as Golgotha, or the place of the skull. This is on the Mount Moriah range, which goes right through, and the Temple Mount is on one part, and the highest point of that mountain range is just north of that area, and it sits at 777 feet above sea level. Imagine that. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. So they're within eyeshot of this place. Very well could be a bunch of olive trees there. Stay with the donkey and the lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and he laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife and the two of them went together. It looks like Abraham's going to do this thing. It's interesting because there were two men with Jesus when he was crucified. And the father laid the wood on Jesus, did he not? As he went up that hill, that very same hill, 2,000 years later, God sends his son and he actually does it. He sacrifices his son for you and me. This is dress rehearsal for the coming of Jesus Christ. Do you get this? And Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father, and he said, here I am, my son. He's getting to get a little concerned. Then he said, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Isaac's getting wise. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. They went in agreement. That's actually the original Hebrew, the better uh, uh, understanding. They went in agreement. The father and son went up the hill in agreement. Notice Jesus questions the father. Do you remember when Jesus was in the garden? Lord, if this cup can pass from me, but not my will, thy will be done. Interesting how this foreshadows everything about when Jesus comes. This is God's purpose. This is how he speaks to us. Prophecy is not necessarily a foretelling of the future and happening. It's pattern. It's pattern. And God is trying to get us to understand when Jesus shows up, how would you not believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, reading this chapter and looking at the life of Jesus? Amen. Well, it's only by faith. You're never going to convince somebody against their will. 
And so Jesus ends up being the Lamb of God that gets provided for in the future that Isaac is a picture of. But they end up going up the hill. In John 129, it says this, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist recognized Jesus in this story and called him the Lamb of God. God himself was the lamb. Jesus himself became the lamb. Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Do you believe that God loves you that much that he would have his son murdered for you? Boy, that's a, that's a lot of obligation, isn't it? I feel like I should do more. And then they came to the place in which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar, because that's what he does everywhere he goes. And there, and placed the wood in order, and he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. He bound his son. You're not going to bind a 30-year-old without his consent. Amen. He bound him. He had to because the picture, the picture that it shows is of a father binding his son even as Jesus was bound to the wood. This is much more than a simple parable. This is much more than God asking for a sacrifice. This is dress rehearsal for Jesus Christ coming again. If I keep pressing the button, something will happen. Perhaps I need help. Try to reconnect, see what happens here. The angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. By the way, ladies, if you have to speak to a man, <laughs> it might take two. Just saying. Moses gets the same treatment. There's a whole bunch of people who get the same treatment as two. You remember Jesus saying, verily, verily, I say unto you? It's an attention-getting thing, too. It, it might take two. And the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. Apparently, he's got it in his mind he's going to do this thing. And now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. God keeps making that point, your only son, for a very good reason. Because we see Christ come, his only son, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In Hebrews 17, we're given an explanation. If you ever wonder what the Old Testament says, usually you can find something in the New Testament because the New Testament's a commentary on the Old Testament. Christ is often hidden in the Old Testament, but he's revealed in the New and so we see Hebrews chapter 11, 17 to 19 says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises, remember he got a promise that Isaac was going to be his seed and have all sorts of offspring, offered up his only begotten son, of whom it is said, In Isaac your seed shall be called. Concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. So in the New Testament, we're told Abraham was thinking in the back of his mind, God's got a problem because he promised me that my seed, by the way, that's singular, not plural, that my seed would come through Isaac. And if I kill Isaac, well, then he's got to raise him from the dead. Abraham believed in the resurrection. Interesting. Interesting. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, confess him with your mouth, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
It's interesting. The resurrection's right in that little teeny condensed bit of the gospel. So he reasoned, well, God's going to raise him from the dead. So he was able to be faithful because he reasoned in his mind, God's got a problem because he said this, but he's telling me to kill him. That's God's problem. It's like when my car doesn't start. Lord, your car doesn't start. It's gotten cold and I didn't know, but I got a new battery, so I'm okay. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape so that you may be able to bear it. Here it is. God made an escape. The angel of the Lord showed up and stopped him. The Lord doesn't want you to do something. Trust me, he'll stop you. You know that? If you're faithful to call out to him and you think he's telling you to do one thing and you go, well, I don't really want to step out because maybe I'll make a mistake. Well, here's Abraham doing exactly what God told him to do and God stopped him just before he did the deed. Well, I don't know if I should take this job. I don't know if I should do. You know, there, we question and we're so worried about making a mistake. Why don't we trust in the Lord and let him lead us and get bold and step out? Say, okay, Lord, I'm going to be bold and step out. You told me to do this. I believe you told me to do this. The only one I'm going to know is to do it. And he stepped and suddenly an angel showed up and stopped him. You know, God loves you that much too. He'll stop you from doing something crazy. Verse 13, Abraham lifted his eyes and he looked and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. It's interesting, Abraham got it. He was like, aha, there's a ram. Ram means that it's a male. It was caught by its horns. You know what horns represent as you look throughout the scripture? Power because you don't want to meet the horns, right? You mess with the bull, you get the, you get the horns, right? So that always represents power. In fact, there were horns on the altar in the temple. And if you went and you grabbed hold of those and you prayed and you cried out to God, it was because you were, pro, you were asking God to come and help you by his power. So whenever you see horn, the horn of Jesse is how Jesus is referred to sometimes. It's the power of God. So anyway, I probably get way too deep for you. That's what horns are. So this ram is caught by its horns in a thicket, in a thorn bush. You remember when thorns came to be? In Genesis, when sin hit the earth. He said, now the earth is going to bear the marks of sin from now on. The ground will not give forth its fruit as it once did. Thorns and thistles it will produce for you. So thorns and thistles, they're actually undeveloped fruit that become something you don't want in your yard, right? Especially if you have children or if you have to landscape it. He's caught by his horns in a thicket. There was another thorn bush that was on fire up on Mount Sinai later on where Moses comes and sees the Lord and the Lord speaks to him. We get the idea of substitutionary atonement. This is far before the law, far before Moses shows up. That's like 4,000 years ago this happened. This substitutionary atonement where one is going to be sacrificed for another. We see that all the way back in Genesis, God set down this substitutionary atonement where a blood sacrifice would be required to cover over sin. And it's reinstituted here with Abraham. Interesting, Jesus had a crown of on his brow the sign of redemption from sin. That's why that was his crown. You see how all this fits together? It's hard for me to tell up here because you're all very quiet. This is one of my favorite chapters. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide. That, that's an interesting name. It's actually Jehovah Jireh. You may have heard of it. The Lord will provide Notice he didn't say the Lord has provided. Abraham knew he was doing something prophetic. The Lord will provide. He called the mountain where all that happened, the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. I thought he just provided. Didn't you just sacrifice the ram for your child? Yeah, but the Lord will provide. He's looking forward. He knows something. He knows something about what God's up to. The Lord will provide. Jehovah Jireh. 
John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's who he was prophesying of. The Lord shall provide. And God provided his son on that same exact hill that Abraham sacrificed his son on. The Lord will provide. He got it right. John 8, 56 to 58, Jesus is arguing with the Pharisees because they don't believe he is who he says he is. And he says to them, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old. And you've seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am, which is the sacred name of God, I am. Jesus says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. When did, when he said, the Lord will provide. He was looking forward to the day of Jesus Christ when he would come. Abraham saw my day and was glad. So the angel says, blessing, I will bless you and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven. We've heard this before. And as the sand in which is on the seashore and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In other words, they'll prevail even though they'll have enemies. In your seed, all the nations, by the way, that's singular. All the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. He's talking about Jesus Christ, the seed of the woman. And so Abraham returned to his young men and they rose and they went together to Beersheba and Abraham dwelt in Beersheba. And so that's the end of the story of Abraham and Isaac. I want to ask you a question. Do you see something missing? Perhaps someone missing. Anonymously not mentioned in the passages or in the passages to follow. It's Isaac. He seems to disappear. He disappears from the narrative of Scripture until he gets a wife. Do you think it's prophetic? Do you think Jesus Christ is dying and going on the cross and then his absence and the next time we know about him is when he comes back for a bride? Do you think that's a coincidence? Absolutely not. You don't see him for another chapter and a half. Now it came to pass after these things that it was told Abraham saying, indeed, Milcah has also borne children to your brother Nahor. Huz is firstborn, Buzz his brother. That must have been fun. <laughs> Kemuel, the father of Aram, Chesed, Hazo, Pildash, Jidlaf, and Bethuel. And Bethuel begot Rebekah. You see, this is a setup, boys. These are clues. These eight Milka bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother, his concubine, whose name was Ruma, also bore Teba, Geham, Thahash, and Maka. And you go, well, that's kind of an anticlimactic end to this chapter, but it's a setup for what's coming because Isaac is unmarried and he's going to get a wife and we know it to be Rebecca. And so the line of where Rebecca comes from, it's an interesting parallel between Isaac and Ishmael, right? Both of them are in danger when they leave, right? Both of them oldest of their mother. Both of them end up almost losing their lives where God has to rescue them. There are angels involved. It just goes on. So here is the genealogy of Abraham and where Rebecca lies is right over in here. And we know that she's going to become a wife for Isaac in another quick couple chapters. And so that's why that's mentioned there. It's a setup for the bride of Isaac. And you don't hear Isaac's name mentioned again until that moment when he gets a bride. I just find that to be Amen. exciting. By the way, there's just a few parallels between Isaac and Jesus. <laughs> and in case you missed any of the little Easter eggs that I didn't show up, it's here. The resurrection was prophesied by Abraham because he said, we will come back to you, to the men. Remember? He says, I am the lad he was Irish, apparently. We're going up the hill, we're going to worship, and we'll come back. 
and he reasoned that there was a resurrection. Jesus said, I will rise on the third day. The sun was laid on a wooden cross. The sun was laid on wood. Abraham had a knife to pierce his son. Jesus' skin was pierced by whips and laced with bones and glass and rocks. If you look at Isaac and you look at Jesus, there are tons of similarities. I just wanted to show you that, yes, I didn't probably go over all of them, but there are many of them. He was the only son as far as God was concerned, and he loved him. So, I wonder, would you and I do so well in a test like that? Is your relationship with God tested into a place where your character would be such that you acquiesce to God's will if he asks you to do something really tough? A loved one that you have to let go, much like Abraham, or something that he would want you to sacrifice to him. I have to tell you, I want to ask God for grace in time like that because he won't give it to you ahead of time because what would you do with it? He'll give it to you at the time that you need it. And I, I know that's God's promise. So, I just can't figure it out. So, that is the birth and the death of Isaac and his resurrection. Next week, We've got an entire chapter dedicated to the death of Sarah. Sarah finally dies. And it's an interesting fact about her. She's the only woman in the Bible that gives her age. It's a good principle, don't you think? <laughs> to state your age if you're a woman. No, I'm just kidding. The only woman whom her age is actually stated. Just so that you... Uh, so you go away with that little fun fact. This is one of my favorite chapters in the scripture, chapter 22, because it lays out God's plan for redemption so incredibly clearly that it would be easy to explain to somebody that 4,000 years ago, God was setting the stage and making a dress rehearsal for the coming of his own son 2,000 years after this. He loves us so much that he has left a testimony in his word about what his plans are and what his plans are for you. I pray that you might lay hold of that today and the Lord might give you joy. In Jesus' name. Amen.